We're going to be in Daniel chapter 4. If you would open your Bibles to page 928, we'll get started. This probably, this chapter, to me is one of the most incredible chapters in the whole Bible. And I'll tell you why. It's the, one of the greatest testimonies you will ever hear from a Gentile. Or, for that matter, even from a Jew, from anybody. It's a, a fantastic testimony. And up to this point, Nebuchadnezzar has been blessed by God so much not only did God raise him up from a nothing to become king over a land, it, it's the, uh, a huge empire, but he also has now allowed him to have, of the nation of Israel, the cream of the crop, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And he has been teaching Nebuchadnezzar some things about Yahweh through these four men. And as we remember last week, we saw where that God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to be the first person in the Bible to recognize and talk about the Son of God. And in the fiery furnace, he learned that God is, <laughs> he's the, a real God who can deliver out of people's hands. And, you know, so we learned that last week. The problem is, and what we're going to see this week, is that sometimes God blesses us, and, and this this runs true in no matter what area. You don't have to be king. But God blesses and blesses and bless you. And after a while, you start thinking, you're doing it. This is you. <coughs> We're going to see how God reacts to that. Just remember, the Lord says, six things the Lord hates, yea, seven. The proud look on a man. What do we have to be proud of? Okay, chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king. Unto all people, nations and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God, capital G, has wrought towards me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his domain is from generation to generation. What a statement from a Gentile heathen king. Only I, at this point right now, don't think he's such a Gentile heathen king anymore. I think he, if, if he was in the New Testament, we'd be calling this man born again. You know, I think there's a good chance that when we get to heaven, we're going to get to talk to Nebuchadnezzar, okay, because he really started to believe. Now, he's, this is his testimony. And you know, if you're a king and you're going to give a testimony about something you did, if you have the scribes write it, you know there's just certain things you usually leave out. He didn't leave anything out. I like that. That tells me that the hand of God was on him even when he was writing the testimony. He has really had a heart change. Because remember, all the way up to this time, Nebuchadnezzar is a king that has life and death within his power. He says, you die, you're dead immediately. He says, you live, you get to live. It's just that simple. He says, you go here, you go there. You go there. You know, I mean, he has total, absolute power over human beings. That's how mighty he is. And we're going to see now how God says, that's okay, I gave you that power, but don't take it to your head. Okay, in verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar, he says, was at rest in my house, and, and he says, flourishing in my palace. You know, the wording, you kind of get the idea, he's flourishing in his palace, you know. Look at this wonderful, fabulous, great place, you know. And then by, verse 5, it says, I saw a dream which made me afraid. Now, for the king to be afraid, and that's a good word for this, too, because he was afraid. I think he had the, a twinge of realizing something was up about him. He says, the thoughts upon my bed and the visions in my head, it troubled me. Therefore, I made a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Now, what are these wise guys doing? Well, remember, we just got through the Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and fiery furnace. They're probably trying to cool that furnace down. You know, it was seven times hotter, and they had to cool it down. It probably cracked the outer cave. No, you know, they're busy. They got things to do. But here they get brought back in, and it's another one of those dream things. And they're going, oh, no. Man, I'll be glad when we get a king that quits dreaming. You know, because they can't interpret dreams. They, they, they have a problem with that. Dreams, the interpretation of dreams belongs to the God of heaven. That's just all there is to it. 
So he, he needs his dream interpreted again. He says in verse 7, he says, Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Why didn't they make known the interpretation? They didn't know. They didn't, know. They didn't have the faintest idea. He says, But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belshazzar. He says, According to the name of my little g God, and in whom there is the spirit of the holy gods. Now, you notice that holy and gods is, is not capitalized either. Before him, I told the dream, saying, O Belshazzar. Now, see, that he, what he's saying, he's giving you the words, and if you understand here, he's saying, you see, I still believed in all the little gods. I believed their god was great. You know, why? Well, because, you know, he had delivered them out of the mighty, fiery furnace and, and everything. So I, I know that th their god is great, but I've still got our gods. You know, they're, they're great in their area too, you know. It's just they have a different expertise. So anyway, he says in verse 9, Belshazzar, he says, Master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret trouble thee. Tell me the vision of my dream that I, might, that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. He says, Thus were the visions of my head, he says, in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth. And the height thereof was great. So you get this whole picture of, you know, like one of our globes. And, and, and this tree sprouted up out of it. And this tree overshadowing the whole earth. In 11 it says, For the tree grew and was strong. And the height thereof reached into the heavens. And the sight thereof, the end of all the earth. He says, And the leaves thereof were fair. And the fruit thereof much. And in it was meat for all. And the beasts of the fields had, shad had shade or shadow under it. He says, And the fowls of the heavens dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. He says, I saw in the vision of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. Ah, new introduction of a new character in our Bible. The watchers. Who are the watchers? What is their job, and who are they watching? Very interesting. The watchers. Do you realize that everything that's going on every day on this earth is being watched from heaven? The watchers. Yeah, it was said. That's what scares me. Yeah, that's true. They watch everything that's going on. Nothing is out of God's control. Nothing is out of his sight. These watchers apparently... They are creations, we might call them angels, you know, that was created by God, and their job is to watch mankind on this earth. What all is going on? Now, what we're going to see is these watchers are being given a specific amount of power, a great deal of power to do things, you know, with human beings or whatever. But normally, the term watchers mean they're just watching and then probably telling back, you know, into heaven or whatever is going on. The eyes of the Lord. But, uh, but to, they don't normally get involved. Now there's, you know, some different theories uh, about watchers that possibly it was some of the watchers that left their first estate, their habitation, and came down to the earth and cohabitated with the women of the earth. Now that's a, that's a theory that it possibly was some of the watchers that did that. They watched too much, too close. But, you know, I, I don't know about that. But I, I do know here, it says that the holy ones, they are holy. They came down from heaven. He says, and he cried aloud and said thus, hew down. This is what the watcher said. Hew down the tree. That means cut it down. Cut off its branches. It, notice it says cut off his branches. He says shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Now who's he talking about? We're going to find out this tree is Nebuchadnezzar. And the watchers are coming down and say, we need to prune this tree real good. We need to cut it back real bad. In 15 it says, nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of the heavens, and let the, his portion be with the beasts of the grass of the, feet of the earth, he says, let his heart be changed from a man's heart, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Wow. If this is Nebuchadnezzar, and we will find out it actually is, that they're talking about, what are they saying? 
Well, he's represented by a tree in this dream. And they're going to cut this tree down and they're going to put bands around this tree, around the stump of this tree. An iron band and a brass band. Iron always uh, represents angelic in the, uh, it, 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 all through the Bible. Iron is a representation of angelic, something outside of our realm. The brass always represents uh, judgment. The fiery furnace, the brass feet on Jesus as if in fine brass and whatever. It's always judgment. It represents that. So what we're saying is these bands on him is saying this is going to be done from heaven and he's going to be judged. And judgment isn't always to your end. What do I mean by that? Well, we have a, a tendency to think that like if you're judged and found guilty of murder, then they, they take your life. But a lot of times if you're judged and found guilty in the middle of your life of something, what it is you get then a, uh, a punishment that really is going to help you change your way of life and then you can be better and go on. And that's what this judgment is about, is not to take him completely out because what we're going to find is when they leave the stump, that's because his kingdom will be, it will be sure unto him. Now, this kind of judgment, I, I, I look at it and I go, Gee, I'm glad, there's a part of me that says, I'm glad this kind of judgment doesn't come on all of us. Then there's another part of me saying, oh really? Do we all not get judged by the Lord as we go through our walk? It's not, maybe that is some of the hills and the valleys and some of the tribulations that come into us, into our lives, because it's judgment of the Lord saying, you need to change something in your character or you need to do something a little different so I'm going to bring you this reminder, this thing to where you have to turn to me a little bit, and we're going to straighten something out in your life. I take a look at the book of Job. Every time I think about judgment and changing character, I always look at the book of Job. Because that was God's total purpose in the book of Job, with Job, was to change something deep inside of him. And in order to get that, he had to get through everything else in his life to get there. And he used Satan to do that. To finally get into a place inside of Job in his pride that God could deal with Job. And it, it's a very interesting book. I, I hesitate from teaching that book you know, too often, though I think about it all the time, but there's just so much. His friends give so much air in doctrine throughout all their discourses and, and, and the things they talk about. People think that the new movement that's come on the earth in the last, you know, 50 years, the health and wealth is new. Well, no, no, Job's friends had health and wealth. That was their whole point. If, if God's happy with you, he blesses you, gives you everything. If he's not happy with you, he takes everything away. If you're in sin, well, that's, that's the health and wealth kind of uh, uh, theory with him. But anyway, I, I look at that and I go, how, how is that in our own lives, though? Because remember... God's end for us is good. I know my thoughts towards you, that they're not for evil, but they're for good, that you might be happy or you might live well and have a good ending. So God is going to have to work with us in the middle of this, what we call life, you know, to get us to a good ending from his perspective. You know, a good ending from our perspective might just be, Fat and wealthy, I guess, or lazy or something. I don't know, whatever, from human. But from his perspective, holiness. And so there's going to have to be a little working done with all of us, a little bit changes there. So here he's going to do with Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to do this work in the middle of it. Now, the part here that's really hard to take and understand, you know, when, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel asked to eat grass and lettuce and all that stuff instead of the king's meat, uh, you know, we just called that vegetarians. But this is a whole other ball game here. This, his heart, is going to be changed from a man's heart, a human heart, into a heart of a beast, and he's going to graze in the front yard for seven years. Seven seasons are going to pass over. And that's really hard for you and I to accept that you could be changed into something else and then changed back. But remember, we're dealing with a God who created humans to start with without even a prototype. 
He can do just about anything he wants to do. Another part that kind of always I like to bring attention to is the fact is, it doesn't say this is the Father. It doesn't say that this is the Son. It doesn't say this is the Holy Spirit. It says this is the watchers doing this. That is interesting to me. That much power has been put into their hands to watch us humans and to keep us humble before the Lord. Well, let's just look and see what this is, what is going to happen to him. In verse 17, it says, This matter is by decree of the watchers. See, that's of the watchers. It's their decree. And they demand by the word of the holy ones. He says, To the intent that the living might know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the, the basis of men. Otherwise, he take, if he wants to, he can take the absolute worst of the worst of the worst man on this earth and make him the king over all the earth if he wants to and make him the greatest man in the world. God can change our hearts. Now, don't look at that negative. Take that positive. Because God can make you into what he wants you to be with his image of his son and live with for eternity in a holy place. You think, well, how can God change me? You know, I'm so set in my ways on this and I'm old and I've done this and I've done this and I think this way. Well, understand this. God can do it. He says that good work that he has started in you, he will finish until the day of Christ Jesus. You're never more than he can handle. God never started a task that he couldn't finish. Believe me. He's not a quitter either. And so he will do it if he said he's going to do it. In verse 18, it says, This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. He says, Now thou, O Belshazzar, he says, Declare the interpretation there, thereof. See, this is before, this is when he gets the dream. So he's taunting Belshazzar and he's, you know, and his little G gods and all that, because he's trying to be honest in this, you know, in a testimony, we don't have to embellish our, our testimonies. Just say them like they really happened. There, if God was in the midst of it, it really is great anyway. It's all we need to be. He says, therefore, he says, for as much as all the wise men in my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, he says, for the spirit of the holy gods, little g's, notice that, is in thee. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished, he says, for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. And the king spoke and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble you. Belshazzar answered, and he said, My Lord, the dream be to them that hate you. Whoa, wait a minute. This is not going to be a good thing. This is going to be good for the people who hate you. Do you know that every time God works in my life to change me a little bit more into the image of his son, the people of the world get really excited because usually it's through a trial or something I'm going through. And they get real excited and start to dance around the fire. You know, I mean, we got him, we got him, we got him. And, and you know, and so this is what he tells me. So people, this is dream, is gonna, it's a good thing for those that hate you. That should give you an indication, O king, this is not going to be good for you. Okay. And the interpretation thereof, he says, to thine enemies. Otherwise, if this thing gets out, man, they're going to throw a party all over the world. You know what this should remind you of? It, it, it just hits me one right after another. I mean, these thoughts just keep coming to me, and I'll tell you what it, this one is. Is the two Old Testament saints that are brought back by the Lord in the time of the Great Tribulation, Jacob's trouble, seven years uh, of the Great Tribulation, and they walk the streets and give the Antichrist nothing but trouble. Two Old Testament saints. You know, and I, I just, I see this here, and I, and I just go, wow, because when they finally get put to death, it says the whole world throws a party and gives gifts one to another and, has, and watches them laying dead in the streets of Jerusalem. They leave their bodies in the streets and have the camera. And right now, live cam in Jerusalem, you can on your internet go over and watch people walking around in front of Temple Mount right now. Live cam is there already. Well, I mean, that we've waved to our kids through live cam back here in the United States. So it's there, and just two saints get put to death. They're laying there, and they keep live cam on them, and the whole world throws a party. Why? Because the whole world, remember, the Christians are gone. 
And these guys walk around bringing back up the Lord and how it should be and causing fire to come down on people and causing, you know, judgment and whatever. When they finally get put to death, the whole world's celebrating. They think they've won. Of course, it says three days later, they get back up off the ground and ascend into heaven right on live cam. And that really makes people nervous. <laughs> Would me. <laughs> Verse 20, it says, The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached into heaven, and the sight thereof uh, to all the earth, he says, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the fields dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heavens had their habitation. You know, it, it, isn't that interesting? Because in this tree, Birds are always considered, you have to have consistency of the Bible, and all the way through the Bible, birds are considered to be the bad things. They take away the seed of God that was sown in the field. They, you know, birds, birds are not are unclean things. So, but it's in the, his branches, many birds roost, you know, in his government, in his parliament. It's kind of like our government. Many bad birds roost in the government, you know. And, and, and then it says, and the beasts are, of the field are in underneath it, you know, for shade and whatever else. Well, you know. I, it, it, the bigger the organization, the more trouble you have keeping it cleaned out. It just, I'll put it that way. Okay. It is thou, O king, in verse 22, thou art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reached unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. At that time, all the known habitation of the earth, anything that was anything at all, was under his control. Great empire. You know, and he's a mighty empire. He actually set up the first government of, uh, type. Uh, the Syrians had a, a, a government, but it wasn't a government that was ran, you know, by uh, anything. It was just, they were just big, a lot of them, and they controlled a lot of things. But this is, this is setting up governments and taking over and bringing people in and making them part of the, of the deal. So anyway, it was huge. And God had raised him up to do that. In 23, it says, And whereas the king saw a watcher, and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof into the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of the heavens, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. Wow. In 24, here's the interpretation, king. O king, this is, is, is the decree of the Most High which come upon my Lord the king. He says that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know, this is what you're going to know when it's all over said and done, that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and give it to whomsoever he will. He says, and whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree root, he says, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. He says, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Now, how many people need to be taught that lesson today? I just wonder if maybe some of us in this room don't need that lesson. Now, we don't want it to come on us like that. But that the heavens rule, do you really get what he's saying here? We think we control so much of our lives and we control our destinies, you know, to, we think we do. We think that we can build little empires and that we can be, uh, we can tell other people how to run their lives and everything. Do we not understand we are a creation from a true and living God and, and he is in total absolute touch with and control of his whole creation? I mean, he knows your thoughts right now. And more than that, he knows the intent behind those thoughts right now. See? And you say, well, what do you mean by that? You see, the intent behind it, it is either the intent is because we love him, or the intent could be the rebellion that hides and lurks within our flesh and we rebel against that. Well, he... Yeah, he may control some things, but I, 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 you know, he knows the intent. Boy, and that's, when you really stop to think about that, and you go, well, you know the part to me that makes him 
so great when I know that that he still doesn't get so involved he makes robots out of us. He still gives us a free will. Isn't If you had that much power over something. See, we don't even have power over our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids, but we want to run their lives. Because we, we can see what they're doing wrong. We can see how they could change it and make it better. They just won't let us run their lives. You think God couldn't run our lives better than we're doing it? Of course he could. You think that the angels standing there by the throne couldn't run our lives better than we're doing it? I think that anybody up there in heaven that has, can see the whole picture could do a better job than we're doing down here. But God says, uh-uh, I gave them free will. You all leave them alone. Nobody gets involved. See, that's what was so bad when the angels got involved with the women of the earth. They got involved. God says, leave them alone. I have this thing under control, and I know where it's going. Leave them alone. They have to prove themselves. Well, in 27, you notice now the king's got the decree. Once the decree goes out, does it, can it change? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But I think maybe it could. Listen, because you know, Daniel, remember, he's a pretty wise guy. He's one of the wise guys. He's going to tell him how you can change the decree. Well, listen to this. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. I'm going to give you some counseling right now. It's what, never, it's what Daniel's saying. Listen to this counseling. Break off thy sins by righteousness. What do you mean? You and I both know the areas in our lives we're sinning in. We all are. To some extent. We know what they are. We know how we could change them. We know what would change them. We're just not ready to have them changed yet, are we? I mean, but we know. But what Daniel's saying is, break off thy sins by what? Righteousness. Where are you going to get righteousness? Only at the throne of God. He's the, the, he is the king of righteousness. He is the Lord of righteousness. And you get that by coming to him and by being there with him. Okay, sins by righteousness and thy iniquities. What's the difference between sins and iniquities? We, we've, we've stated that many times. Sin is when you do something out of the will of God. You may not even know it. Iniquity is when you know it, you know what it's going to, the consequences, you go ahead and do it anyway because your flesh wants it. You're, you're, you just, you're willing to take it on. Or you don't believe God will, he, mean that, he didn't mean it for you. He meant that for everybody else. You're special. You know, it's really strange, but we talk to ourselves that way sometimes. Like God really loves us. It's okay. You know, I think that's what gets a lot of top pastors and, and people like that in trouble. Is they start thinking they're so special to God. Because they are special to him. And he may talk to them. He may give them special gifts. And he may show them special things. They start thinking they're above. You know, uh, I wasn't this way, but when I was with the police force, <laughs> they used to have a saying, they used to have a saying, we're not above the law, we are the law. Now think about that. That's why you see them run every stop sign they go through. They go through the red lights, they do any, they speed all the time and whatever else. They, but you can't, you know. But anyway, he says, break off thy sins by righteousness and thy iniquities, he says, by showing mercy to the poor. Iniquity, like I said, is something you know is wrong, you do it anyway. We all do that against people. We either talk bad about them or we uh, do something wrong against them or something to benefit ourselves or whatever. That's, that's the iniquity. And what is he saying to change that? To go out and do what you know is for the poor that isn't for you. They can't repay you. They can't restore anything back to you. You're just going to go do it. Because that's what the Lord would have you do. That's how you change iniquities. Stop doing what you know is wrong and start doing what you know is right. See? And, and then sinning, stop sinning and start doing righteousness. See? That's what Daniel, is that good advice? Yes. Very good advice. Is that advice we could all take? Yes. But what are we probably like? Just like Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. 28. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. In 29, he says, at the end of 12 months, oh, it's been a whole year. God must have forgot. The watchers aren't watching. I mean, you know, or something, because it didn't ever happen. 
the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. He says, and the king spake, and he said, is not this great Babylon that I, I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might, oh, by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. Now, you wouldn't say something like that about yourself, would you? Wow, this marriage is so good because I have made him that way. I have done this. This ministry, wow, we've really put effort into this. We have really made a great ministry. Oh, come on, guys. We're so guilty in so many different ways of this, in a minor way. It's probably good, too, or else they'd be cutting our stump down. Okay, in 31, he says, While the word was still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. Why, he was still speaking these words about how great he was and all the wonderfulness that he had done and how his power exceeded anything of the earth, even why the sentence was, you think he was saying these things out loud? I'm not sure he was. Maybe, oh, isn't this wonderful? But what are you thinking when you're saying, oh, isn't this wonderful? That I have done. And why it's still in his mouth, those words. He says in 32, and this voice went on and said, And they shall drive thee from men. Thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the fields. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And seven times shall pass over thee until thou knowest the most high rule to the kingdom of men and give it to whomsoever he will. Now, it hasn't happened in 12 months, in a year, and you just heard it again, probably doesn't mean it this time either, right? The same hour, verse 33, was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, his nails like birds' claws, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. Seven years later. Now, get this picture. Daniel's who? The governor, second in control, right? Here's the king. And the people come in, all the satraps, all the counselors and governors from all the area and things. We, we want to talk to the king. You went right by him. What? What are you talking about? When you came in, that was him out in the front yard eating. He's grazing in the front yard. That's the king. Seven years he's grazing. Now, can you imagine any kind of a kingdom over any kind of people like us or anyone else, and somebody doesn't rise up in the seven years to take that kingdom over? Can you imagine that? When Nebuchadnezzar, remember, no one... No one dared do anything without his okay. He totally ran the whole kingdom. He appointed people. He took them out of appointments. Out of appointments means they chopped up in little pieces and threw you in fiery furnaces and stuff like that. He, he ruled with an iron hand, and now for seven years, he's not there ruling, ruling his kingdom. Who's there running the kingdom? Daniel. How's Daniel running his kingdom? exactly like Nebuchadnezzar ran this kingdom. Now, you have to admit, if you were second in the control, control, and for seven years your boss was out in the front yard eating grass, you might want to move up and take over just a little more authority and position, right? Oh man, this bed of his is really nice. I like his room. You know, you might move up in the castle a bit. You know what I mean? Just till he gets back. Till he quits eating grass. Till the yard's mowed. You know, I, I look at this and I go, remember, God's doing this, not in another man's heart comes in the thought of taking over this kingdom. Not once in seven years does Daniel think about moving up the ladder. Daniel knows exactly what's going on. Everything just stays as it was for seven years. Isn't that interesting? 
Now take that seven, seven year period of time and look at the time of the Great Tribulation. Is anything going to stay the same as it was? Nothing. That's the difference. God's going to, God had his hand on this whole kingdom for seven years. Nothing changes. During the Great Tribulation, God takes his hand off of it and allows Satan to have free reign for seven years. Nothing stays to change or stays the same. Everything is changing. And is it changing for the good or the worse? Worse. God says if he hadn't shortened the days, man would totally do away with himself. Think about that. So, here it is. He, at the end of this time, Nebuchadnezzar lifted up his eyes and his, return, his understanding returned to him. That meant he didn't have any understanding the whole time he was out there, did he? Can you imagine? Now, I, I, my brain, very, I'm kind of used to thoughts going by for several minutes and nothing there. You know, and then all of a sudden something will come by and I go, oh, yeah, you know. But for seven years, no understanding? You know, not wanting to get back inside, not wanting to take a bath, not wanting to have a barbecue or something, you know, for seven years. He says, his understanding returned. He says, and he says, my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the most holy, the high, he says, the most high, and I praised and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. So what's the first thing in his thought and his understandings when it comes back to him? God is who he says he is. There really is a God. He really can change. Do you really believe, because the word of God says so, that he took the heart of man out of him and put the heart of a beast in him? And then put the heart of a man back in him? Now it's before you really come to a conclusion on that, remember God said he's going to take your heart of stone and put it, change it into a heart of flesh. He's still in the heart changing business. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Wow. 35. Because, <clears throat> you, you know, we've been born in the greatest nation in the world at this time. And in pretty good place in this nation all of us here and we're doing okay but remember you could have been born a rock and, and the best you would have got is be to make a fence somewhere <laughs> 35 and all the inhabitants of the earth were he says reputed as nothing and he does a does a what does he mean Everything any man can do and put his hand to when you're talking about God, man is nothing. Absolutely nothing. You know, I, I don't care if you, you build the tallest building in the world, which they're trying to rebuild the tower, Twin Towers, and I guess the tallest one's over in where Japan somewhere. Of all the places, earthquakes and everything, they have the tallest building. But anyway, it's nothing. Nothing. All that engineering, all the skills, all these, the Hoover dams, all these dams, nothing. All these great metropolitan, you know, the streets and the sewer systems and the water systems and the electricity, the grid and all these great ships. And you, you just no matter who, airplanes that fly out into outer space and back again with men in it and, and all that stuff. That's nothing. It's just nothing when you're talking about God. Those are just things he let man share in. He give them. Where did man get that stuff? It has to come from the Lord. He just let man share in that. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. That's interesting, too, to make note of that. People sometimes get tell me, that, you know, I, you got you know, Satan's so powerful. And, uh, remember, the, uh, a third of the angels, I said, well, wait a minute, let's stop and think for a minute. Satan is under total control. He's got a chain around him, and God jerks it every now and then. You know, he can only be in one place at a time. God's in total control of him. And understand this, for every angel that left his habitation, there's still two that's there. Twice as many on our side. You know, when it comes down to a real fight, if you're going to go, if you, you know, there's, there's one of you and there's two of them, you're not, you, you know, you're in trouble. It's all there is to it, if, especially if you're all matched in size and strength and everything else. For every bad angel, there's two good angels. And not only that, there's God sitting on the throne that controls the bad angels yet. 
They only have power because he lets them have power. And he could strip them of that power anytime he wanted to. Just like he changed the heart of this man to an animal heart and back. But look at the testimony out of it. He says, the army of heaven amongst the inhabitants of the world, he says, and none can stay his hand. Otherwise, how are you going to stop God? <laughs> you can't stop him. Or you can't say unto him, what are you doing? What does thou? Otherwise, you know, God can do anything he wants to do, and who's going to tell him no? You know, it's like the old question, where, where does a 1,500-pound gorilla sleep? Anywhere he wants to. See? Yeah. 36. He says, at the same time, my reason returned unto me. He says, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. Now, if, if your boss had been out eating grass in the front yard for seven years, would you go to him for counseling? They did. See? Wow, you got to say, somebody's really in charge of them too, isn't it? Of their thoughts and their ways. He says, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me, as if he had never been gone. Isn't, isn't that amazing? What's the type of shadow of that? I see Jesus, whose glory always was before the foundation of the earth for eternity. And he came into about the lowest life you could even imagine out of heaven to come here and become a human and have nothing on this earth, die and pay the penalties for, our, for people who hate you, and he's brought right back and restored, even to a greater than he was before. All things were turned over to him then. Isn't that interesting? 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king, capital K, of heaven, all whose works are true, truth, and his ways, judgment, and those that walk in pride, he's able to abase. Now, there's the warning. Nebuchadnezzar is given a testimony that is a, a testimony that every human being should hear and understand. When God says, six things I hate, yea, seven, the proud look upon a man. What have we got to be proud of? We're sinners. From the moment that we had accountability for our own lives, we started sinning. We will continue to sin. Not one of us seeked after, was seeking after God. All of us were doomed for hell, separated from God for eternity. What have we got to be proud of? See, there's no room for pride. What was it that Satan, his greatest, what's the thing that started his whole career of being, Lucifer, of being Satan from being Lucifer, the light bearer? Pride. He saw himself and how great he, God had made him and he lifted himself up. That's why God hates pride. And we have that seed has been passed down into us all the way from Adam through every generation, that same seed of pride, pride, pride. You know, it's, it's amazing to me. I often say that the things, the ability that God gave me to do things has always been my greatest hindrance from doing the things he wants me to do. Really stop and think about that. The only thing that stops, the only thing that stands between you and heaven is what? Pride. You. See, if we weren't prideful people, we'd just submit and do what the Lord wanted us to do. But we are proud. We're very proud people. You know, we're proud of this. We're proud of that. God says, don't be proud of anything. Be proud thankful he says let this be a thankful generation be thankful he had mercy on us and sent his son to die for us because it was absolutely nothing in us that warranted a saving nothing we were fit for hell before we were even born because that was our nature you know 
you take baby rattlesnakes in an egg, what are they fit for and what is going to be their nature? And what You understand what I'm saying? And that was us. But God had mercy and sent his son to die in our place and pay the penalty for that sin to remove that curse off of us so that we might put on a new nature. You know, one of the things that I see in Nebuchadnezzar, and, and, and I, I think God gave it to us so that we can really visually, because we're visual people, especially us men, and, and, and you have to see it. Have you ever seen anybody have a collection of caterpillars? Have you really? I've never seen a collection of caterpillars. Weird kids. <laughs> Those are worms. They're worms. And they crawl on you and they go. And they got all them feet. And they, no way, we're not there yet. They're caterpillars, a collection of caterpillars. I've seen many people with collections of butterflies. They're beautiful. And they're so delicate. You know, but that worm that's another story altogether, you know. And it's, it's something else. Have you, I mean, you probably have. I was amazed when I finally went to school and stayed in class long enough and went through and saw that, they, that the caterpillar went into and built its own encasement to die to self. Totally to die to self. Have you ever... And, and I've seen a kid do that. You ever open one up to see how he's changing inside, what it is? All it runs out is juice. There's no caterpillar in there anymore. There's no butterfly in there. There's just juice. What do you like, crab? You like crab? I love crab. I like lobster. Mm -hmm. You ever open one of those up before you cook them? Juice runs out. Whole different ball game. But somehow in that death, in that cocoon, the total change of every cell is done that when that finally appears out of there, it's a butterfly or a moth. But we're talking butterflies here. And, and, and it's really interesting, too, that if you help it out of its cocoon, It'll die. The struggle of getting out is what makes it strong enough to be able to fly. It's really, it has to do it itself. You, know, you see how I'm get where I'm going with this thing? God gave us this for a reason. And, and it, it has to be totally changed. And then I used to have on the wall, <laughs> it was in the, bathroom at the group home I worked in on the wall of the bathroom so you looked at it a lot and uh, it was a uh, a chart and it had on butterfly wings one, zero one two three four all the way up to nine and you could go one and zero make ten on the wings, these numbers are on certain butterflies. There's a certain deal when you put them and look at them. That's the number. All the numbers from 1 to 10 are on the wings of a butterfly. Think that's great? Get this. A, B, C, D. The whole alphabet in English is in butterfly wings. You can... Have a collection and have the whole alphabet in butterfly wings. I think Joan just went to get you maybe a copy of that. It is so fantastic. You look at this thing, you go, somebody must have dockered those. No. That's the greatness of our God. The numbers and all the alphabet in English are on butterfly wings. But you, the only way you out of them caterpillars could make numbers if you bent them and twisted them and pinned them down. And, and somebody like me sees a caterpillar. I don't know whether it's going to be a monarch or a moth. You, you understand? Because I, I don't know the change. 
But Nebuchadnezzar had his heart changed from what he was into now a total believer in the God in heaven. You and I as born again Christians, we get this. We're, what we're really building in our Christianity is we're building our own cocoon here on this earth. We're separating ourselves from the world. We're using the things of the world to build this encasement and at the things of heaven around us and we're going to be back in Christ Jesus and we're going to live here, leave here and there's somehow there's this change because right now you look at most Christians in their lives and whatever and if you cut them open just stuff would run out. Do you know I'm talking about their Christianity because a lot of it we don't really have all of our theology we don't really have the whole word of God. We don't really understand the Father in heaven and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You understand we're not there yet. We're dimly looking through a glass. We're in that change that, that's going on right now. You know, and he says to renew your mind, to change this, stop doing this. You put away anger, malice. You do. You understand we're making this change. But when we leave here, we called up into the air. Paul says that sin is in the flesh and we're going to leave the flesh here or else it's going to even be changed in a twinkling of an eye. But we're going to end up being this beautiful thing that was the same thing as the worm down here. Do, do you understand? But we're the only ones that's changed. Do you realize when he talked about the worm of those who don't accept Christ are going to be in the hellfire? It's the worm. They never got to change. They'll be just like they were here on this earth. Do you, do you get that? I mean, because the change hadn't happened in them. We must put off the old man, it says, and put on the new. Because we're headed to a whole new... See, a caterpillar's world is dirt, Sticks, leaves, that's it. And his whole fear is everything eats him. Butterfly, on the other hand, is a whole new world. I, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, monarchs, don't they migrate clear from Canada, clear to South America? Now, if you were a caterpillar, how long would it take you to crawl there? And what's the chances of getting across the highway? <laughs> yeah, you understand? How can you crawl across the ocean? Oh, whole <laughs> different world, isn't it? Is any of the world the same as the other? That's eh, shadows. But it's a whole new world. They eat different things. They, they totally different. We need to start understanding that. That's what Nebuchadnezzar had to come to understanding. God is making out of us a new creature, a new th but we must go through this change. We have to see and understand the things in this body. What? To put away sin for righteousness. To put away transgressions for having mercy on the poor. To do things that way. Because that's our new nature that we have to change into. We're in a process of change. I... Don't know, I never asked the caterpillar, but I bet it's not a pleasant feeling locking yourself in, closing off that one last piece of daylight from the world that you knew, not knowing what's going to happen next to you. And then starting literally, I don't know how else to put it, they literally start to rot in there. It's like, have I done the wrong thing? I'm deteriorating. And they just rot. And then the next thing you know, out of the midst of them emerges this different thing with wings. It's amazing. And God, not only does the alphabet and the numbers, but there's things on, on, on special butterfly and, and moths wings that are unbelievable. There, there's some of them that look like eyeballs looking at you. 
There's some of them that does, and that's for their protection. The birds go to come down like that, and here's this big eyeballs. Looks like a snake looking at them, and so the bird flies away, and it's a, and it's a butterfly. God has built in really strange things into these butterflies. Oh, my goodness, she found it. I, I don't know. I'll get this up on camera so you guys can see it. Uh, I'll, I'll get it really up close and everything. Here's, can you see that? Here, I'll get it straight. There we go. Okay. See, do you see those? Those are wings of butterflies. Isn't that amazing? Tell me there's not a creator. Are you kidding? And not only that, New English. Isn't that amazing? Wow, I'm so glad you found that. We test, test steal that off the wall, that bathroom. Oh, <laughs> I was going to repent. Anyway, I, do you get what I'm getting at in this. This is probably this testimony from this man. This really happened to a man. Today we'd say he went insane for seven years, lost his mind. You know, being king is bound to have stress. And he lost his mind. But seven years later, he came back and had his whole mind and a testimony about God that was unreal. You know, isn't that interesting? I just look at this and I just go, wow. Chapter 4, and this was written in the king's own handwriting. This was his language. This is not in Hebrew. The king's personal testimony. Did you, now, let me go read the first, very first part of that again. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all people, nations, and language that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. This is it. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God has wrought towards me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to to generation. And then he starts his testimony, I Nebuchadnezzar. That's in chapter 4 of Daniel. Isn't that interesting? That God, he, here's a Gentile, and he got to put his testimony in this Hebrew Bible, <laughs> in this holy book. Isn't that awesome? That, that was verse 1. So, you know, as I look at this thing, I'm just going like, I want us to catch this, and I want us to understand this. The watchers are watching, not to the intent to bring us down, except unless we get on a wrong path, and we're headed into a place that's going to end up into us being destroyed. So when trials and tribulations come, what would Paul tell you? Count it all joy. God's about to turn you around from something you don't need to be at. Isn't that interesting? I think it was. Next week, we'll go on with uh, Daniel. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we've had today, Lord, to look at this testimony. Father, I pray that we never forget it, that we constantly come back to here and we think about the change that this man has gone through and that, Father, how that you want to us to change even greater than this. Father, that's my prayer is that we would not grieve the Holy Spirit and allow him to do the work inside of us that he came to do, the baptism of fire. Father, I praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you all.